Thank you for downloading or streaming this message from Emmanuel Church. We are one church with multiple locations, and we believe God wants to bless you right where you are. In a few moments, you're going to hear some practical teaching from God's Word that I believe will be inspiring and relevant to your life. First, though, if you haven't yet experienced Emmanuel Live, we encourage you to go to our website, eclife.org, to check out our service times and locations so that you can experience Emmanuel in person or through our online campus. If this message blesses you and you'd like to support the ministry financially, again, you can go to eclife.org and click on the Giving tab and choose Online Campus at your campus. Thanks again for joining us today. We hope this message will be an encouragement to you on your spiritual journey. Amen. Well, welcome to Emmanuel. And if this is your very first time at any one uh, of our campuses, whether you're joining us here at Greenwood or Banto or Franklin or Garfield Park or at our Seymour campus, or if you're joining us on our online campus or one of our e-microsites, we want to give you a very special welcome. Can we give it up to all of our first time guests today? Thank you for accepting someone's invitation and tuning in or being at one of our locations. If you're not brand new, welcome back. I'm so excited today for all of you to be tuning in and to be at one of our campuses because we're going to be talking about the purpose of our church, like why do we exist? So if you're a guest with us here today, you're going to get an inside peek into sort of what our DNA is and why we do what we do and why we have campuses and why we try to get as many people as possible to attend or watch online. And if you're not brand new, you're going to be reminded of why we do what we do around here at Emmanuel Church. And so we're going to be talking about our mission. We're going to be talking about our purpose. How many of you have heard us say from this platform, Emmanuel exists to see people come to Christ and grow in Christ. Have you heard that? How many of you have heard the the phrase, we are in a relentless pursuit to see people come to Christ and grow in Christ? How many of you have heard that? Yeah, that's what we say around here because that is our mission. So I'm glad that you're here today to hear this. And uh, I want to start today with with some heavy content, some theology, because it's important for us to understand, uh, because it's sort of the foundation of why we do what we do. So hang with me today as I talk through some of this heavy theological content. Let me start with a a study that was put out by Georgetown University. They said that 65 million people die every single year on this planet. That's a lot of folks. That's 178,000 people every single month. That's about, actually, every single day. That's about 7,425 people every hour. It's about 120 people every minute of every day that leave this planet, that perish about two people per second that die and leave this planet. Their life comes to an end. I was reading an article last night about how a bunch of people went to a Halloween party in Seoul, Korea, and they were crushed. Over 100 people just died. They got dressed up, they went to the party, and they didn't know that was going to be the last day of their life. Where do they all go? Where do, where do people go when they die? How many of you have had thoughts about the afterlife or death recently? Anybody? How many of you have had conversations with coworkers or family members about heaven or about hell within the last year? People talk about this stuff. Like death and heaven and how it's on people's mind because we see every day that life, life is fragile. Did you know that only 12, that 12, that 13% of people of Americans today, they believe that there is no afterlife, that once a person dies, you know, their body is put in the grave or their body is cremated and it's, their whole experience as a human is over. There's nothing after the, after life. 13% of Americans believe that. 72% of Americans believe that there is a heaven, that there's a place that you go if you're good, that, you know, afterlife. And 59% of Americans believe that there is a real place called hell. Is is there a heaven? I want to talk about some of this stuff today because it's important to know in our hearts. Is there 
is there really a place called heaven that our souls depart and go to? And, and I'm not going to share with you my opinions because my opinions aren't very valuable, so I'm going to look into the Bible. Is that okay? We're, we use this book as our kind of our, our foundation and what it, what it says. We believe it's the word of God. So we're going to look into the Bible. Is there a heaven? And today I want to look specifically to answer that question. I want to look specifically to the words of Jesus. Jesus said, in my father's house, there are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I'm going to go prepare a place for you? No, it's a rhetorical question. No, I wouldn't have told you that. And then he says in verse three of chapter 14 in the book of John, when everything is ready, when, when I'm all ready to come back, I'll come again and I will get you so that you will always be, say, say it with me, with me, where I am. Now, where is Jesus? He's implying that I've, I've left, when, I, when, he, when he rose from the grave, he went back to heaven. And he says, I'm going to come back when everything's ready, and I'm going to get you, and I'm going to bring you to be with me in a place called heaven. In my Father's house, there are many rooms, plenty of space for you. What did he say? What did Jesus say to the thief on the cross who was about to die? He said, today you'll be with me in paradise. Is there a heaven? Oh, yes, there's a real place called heaven. I can go to, through different passages and show you, but this is one of the best ones. Is there a hell? Only 59% of Americans believe that there is an actual place called hell. Well, let's look to what Jesus had to say about that. In Matthew chapter 25, he says, you know, when everything's ready, I'm going to come back and, and I'm going to sit on my throne and I'm going to separate the believers from the unbelievers as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And to the believers, he's going to say, come into my father's kingdom that's been prepared for you from the creation of, of, the, of the world, from the beginning of time. And then watch what he says to the folks on the left. He says this, then he will say to those on the left, depart from me, you who are cursed into the, say it with me, eternal fire that is designed, prepared for not just certain people, but for, for the devil and for the devil's demons, who were once angels. Hell, folks, is a real place that real people go to because our souls are eternal. And after we die, they, they depart from our bodies and they either go to heaven or they go to hell. Which begs the question then, if we're gonna talk about heaven and hell, like who goes where? Like, who goes to hell? And, and if you've had this conversation around the water cooler with family or friends or wherever in a bar, that's an easy one, right? Who goes to hell? Well, bad people do. The really bad, right? The bad, the, 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 the child molesters and the rapists and the Hitlers and the Stalins and, and, and hell is, the, is this place where really, really bad people go, which surprisingly is true and then it, it's also not true. You say, what do you mean? Well, the Bible does say that really bad people go to hell, but it also says that everyone is on their way to hell. You say, whoa, does it really teach that? Yeah. Who goes to hell? Here's the biblical answer. Sinners go to hell. That's who goes. Not just the really spectacular sinners. <laughs> But the average run-of-the-mill mediocre sinners, they go to. Nobody gets off the hook because the Bible teaches that all of us have sinned. Did you know that? Well, let's look at it. Romans chapter 3, verse 23. Four, say it with me. Oh, everybody. Mother Teresa blew it. Billy Graham, he screwed it up. There's not been a human on this planet that has lived perfectly. For we have all sinned and all of us have fallen short of the glory of God. What does that mean? We have fallen short of the standard that God holds for a person to enter into heaven. The word sin itself is an archery term. It means to, it means to miss the bullseye, to miss the target. Every single one of us, whether you're a spectacular sinner and you really get after it, or you're just an average liar, a bad one at that. Sinners go to hell. Romans chapter 6 verse 23 says the, pay, the penalty or the wage, that's what that word means. The payment of sin is, say it with me, it's death. Death, physical death, that's why we die. Did you know that's why we die? We weren't supposed to die. We die because sin entered the world through Adam and Eve. 
But not just physical death, spiritual death, eternal separation from God. Now you might be thinking a second, saying to yourself, now wait a second, that doesn't sound very fair. I mean, I get that really bad people like Hitler and, 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 and people that, that do really bad, I get that they, they deserve hell, but, but, but little old me, what have I done? I've not robbed a bank. I've not murdered anybody. I've not raped anybody. I've not hurt a child. Why should, I, I'm a pretty decent chap. I'm a pretty decent gal. Why should I go to hell? And the reason why that sounds unfair is because we simply don't understand the standards that God have that God has in order for a person to enter into heaven. James, the brother of Jesus, got this clearer and he wrote about it in his little letter in the New Testament, James. Listen to what James said. He said, for the person who keeps all of the laws, except for how many? One. So they're like perfect in every way, but they got this one law that they keep breaking. Maybe it's lying, maybe it's stealing, maybe it's deception, I don't know. The person who keeps every, all the laws perfectly, except for one, is just as guilty as the person who really is an awesome sinner, who breaks all of God's laws. James says, everybody is in the same boat. Like, it's an all skate, is what James is saying. Everybody's going down. Now, why would that be true? Well, as I mentioned earlier, God has a standard, a standard. And the standard in order to enter into heaven is absolute perfection. Think about it with me like this. This is a nice, pure glass of water. See this, see this glass? Like, you can drink it. it. Tastes fine. It's good. But what if I just added a little bit of rat poison? What do you think? Just, just you know, This is real live rat poison, so this is a live example. Don't be alarmed. What if I just dropped a little bit of rat poison in this thing? Just one little drop. And what if I just kind of gave it a little stir? (sighs) Would you drink it? Should I drink it? No. No. If I drank it, that'd really put you on edge, wouldn't it? (laughs) No, I'm not going to do that. Come on. Some of you nervous Nellies out there, relax. I mean, it's just got a little bit of rat poison in it. I mean, the whole thing's not, I mean, it's just a tiny bit. Would you eat a hamburger with just a little bit of rat poop in it? Just, I mean, just a smidge, just a smidge. What's wrong? It's just a little bit. That, listen, this example is not perfect, but it kind of gives you the idea of what's going on. It's like, in order to get to heaven, you have to be absolutely perfect. You can't even have a little smidge of sin in your life. Who goes to hell? Everybody, because all have sinned, and the penalty of sin is death. You with me? You tracking? Yes? Who goes to heaven? Then, apparently nobody. (laughs) Heaven's an empty place, because we're all going down. Now, when you're around the water cooler or wherever you are talking about these issues, like who's going to heaven, most people actually think they're going. They really do. Because when you ask the question, who's going to heaven, the the, the logical answer that most people have is, well, you know, good people go, and I'm pretty good. So I'm going. What if I told you that's just not true? And I just proved it to you because nobody is good enough. Just a small amount of sin keeps us out of heaven because God's standard is absolute perfection. So the answer to the question, the biblical answer to the question of who goes to heaven is very simple. Forgiven sinners go to heaven. Good people don't go. Forgiven people go. Which is the whole purpose of why Jesus Christ came to this earth. In Romans chapter three, verse 23, Paul says, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Listen to what he says in the next verse, verse 24. Yet God, even though everybody has sinned, everybody's blown it, everybody is, in a sense, contaminated by sin, okay? That's the the case. But yet God, in his, say with me, in his grace, what is grace? It is God's unmerited, unearned, undeserved favor. In his grace, God freely makes us right in his sight. He corrects the problem. He deals with sin. How does he do that? He did it through Jesus Christ, through Christ Jesus, when he freed us from the penalty of our sins. Now, what's the penalty of our sin? The penalty of our sin is death. And Jesus Christ, God, through Jesus Christ, frees us from the penalty 
of death, which is eternal separation from God. Well, how did he do that? Well, he tells us in verse 25, the next verse, for God presented Jesus as the, say it with me, the sacrifice for what? For our sin, my sin, for your sin, even if it's just a little bit. It's enough to keep us out of heaven. So Jesus dies on the cross as a sacrifice. What's the penalty of sin? The penalty of sin is death. What does Jesus do? He dies. Should have been you that died. Should have been me that died. So Jesus dies in our place. And then Paul says people are made right with God when they believe, when they trust that Jesus is sacrifice or Jesus sacrificed his life shedding his blood. We just got done singing a song. Thank you, Jesus, for the blood. Why do we sing that? Such an odd statement. Thank you, Jesus, for your blood. That's odd. The reason we would sing that is because it's the shed blood of Jesus that covers our sin. See, here, here's how it works. Here's how it works. I'll, I'll, I'm doing my best to explain this. I'm asking God to help me. When you look at a cross, what you see are two things. You see the perfect justice of God. Why? Well, remember the standard in order to get into heaven is perfection. And all of us are tainted with sin. So God in his justice has to deal with sin. He will not sweep it under the carpet. He will not look the other way because he loves us. He will not do it. He must deal with sin. And the penalty of sin is death. So when you look at the cross, you're looking at the justice of God. Jesus pays the penalty and satisfies the justice of the law. And the law demanded perfection. Making sense? But when you also look at a cross, what you're looking at is the love of God. You're looking at the justice of God, but you're looking at the love of God because in God's love, he says, no, 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 I'm not gonna make you pay. I'm gonna have my son pay the price for you. Why? Because I love you. And I'm gonna have him die in your place. Listen to how Peter explains it. We like Peter. He's one of the closest disciples to Jesus. Peter says it like this. Christ suffered for our sins once for all time. He never sinned. That's important. Why? Because remember the demands of the law of perfection. Jesus had to live a perfect life. He never sinned. So he lives a perfect life in our place. But he died for sinners. Why did he die for sinners? You and me. Did he die for sinners to start a church? A denomination? A religion? Many people think that Jesus came into this earth to start religion. He didn't. He didn't come to start churches. Jesus came to this earth to die for sinners. Why? Watch this. To bring you and me safely home to God. That is why he came. That is the purpose of his life. It's a rescue mission. I love the way the Apostle Paul explains it in 1 Timothy chapter 1. He's trying to coach his young protege, Timothy, and he says, to, he says to him, this is a trustworthy saying and everybody should accept it. You ready for it? You guys going to accept it? You need to receive this. Do not reject this statement. Your soul depends upon it. The eternal destination of your soul depends upon it. Accept this statement. I'm pleading with you. Paul is pleading with you. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. And I'm the worst one of all. Wow. That's why Emmanuel exists. Listen, if there was another reason why someone said, hey, you should be a pastor, be a church, count me out, don't want to do it. Yeah, but it's really good. You can sing songs and make friends. Nope, don't want to do it. I don't want to sing songs and make friends. I don't want to do it. Yeah, but you could build nice buildings and you know, it could, you could, you know, it could be fun. Nope, don't want to do it. I don't, I don't care. I don't care. I don't care about making friends. I mean, I do, but not, not that much. I don't care about big buildings, don't really care. Don't care about being online, don't, don't really care. Don't wanna be known, don't want people to know my face, don't care. But if you tell me, like, you need to be a pastor because here's why, here's what happens. Jesus came to save sinners. Well, now I'm in. <laughs> like, now I wanna play. Like, put me in the game, coach, because, because I know what that feels like. I've received the mercy of God. I've felt the love of God. It changed my life, and I wanna help other people experience that as well. Does that make sense? That's why Emmanuel does what Emmanuel does because Jesus came to save sinners. One day Jesus was hanging out with a bunch of really bad sinners, tax collectors and other disreputable people. And there were some people that criticized him for doing this. He was having a meal with them and they said, well, I'll just read it. 
Why do you eat and drink with these filthy people, these tax collectors? Like, if you were really a holy man, you'd stay away from these folks. <laughs> and, mean, and Jesus is eating and drinking with them. Listen to what he says. And this could sort, these, these next few verses could be sort of the mission statement of our church. He says to them, come on, guys. The healthy people don't need a doctor. The sick people do. I, I didn't come for the perfect people, by the way. There are none. I didn't come for the righteous. I came for sinners to turn, to repent. That's what the word means, to repent. To turn their life over to God. To bring them safely home to God. To put them in their proper place. This story is a picture of why we do what we do. It's why we go multi-site. It's why we go microsite. It's why we're online and try to get as many people as possible to listen in. It's why every single week I share the gospel at the end of my talk, no matter if I'm talking about envy or worry, or whatever it is I'm talking about. Pastor Cody talked about uh, insecurity a couple weeks ago. Pastor Matt talked about, uh, you know, what did he talk about? Uh, forgiveness, bitterness. Didn't matter. At the end of every single sermon, there's going to be an opportunity for people to repent and turn to Jesus. Why? Because that's, that's the purpose. That's the purpose of why Jesus came into this world. Making sense? Yes or no? So, that explains our church, why we do what we do. What about you? Like, you're here, you're sitting here. Some of you are guests for the first time. We're glad you're here. Some of you have come for a long time. Like, we're going to do what we're going to do as a church because of the mission. What about you? Will you join us on the Relentless Pursuit? Or will you just be a consumer of religious goods? It's a big question. Because churches out, there's a lot of churches out there today. There's churches out there that do fantastic worship. There's churches out there that do really good Bible teaching. There's churches out there that do a lot of good things. And if you don't choose to become a participant in the mission of the relentless pursuit, here's what's going to happen because I've been around for a while. You ready for this? Let me give you some hard talk coming from a loving heart okay can we just have like a cup of coffee together at Starbucks can we just do that not literally but figuratively can we just pretend like it's just me and you if you don't join us on the relentless pursuit to see your friends and co-workers and loved ones and family members come to Christ and grow in Christ you're going to get tired of me my jokes my stories you're going to get tired of the worship it's going to become old hat and you're going to try the new church that just started down the road. You say, how do you know that? Because I've been around. And I talked to Pastor Matt Giebler over at Greenwood Christian. And I talked to Pastor Mike Wiggin at City Life. And I talked to Pastor Brock Glam, Graham over at uh, Pre of, uh, Redeemer Church. I talked to these guys. And they tell me, hey, I just, we just got a new family. I said, oh yeah. They were at Emmanuel for three years. They got tired. Here's why, here's why. Because people treat church like they treat their restaurants when they don't join the mission. It's like, I really like Applebee's. They got this great burger and then, you know, okay, you have it a couple times. It's like, okay, but have you heard about the, the, the bread at O'Charlie's? Have you ever had one of their, it comes out before, it's glazed with honey. Oh my God. <laughs> Screw Applebee's, let's go to O'Charlie's. <laughs> No, can we just talk? Can we just be honest? And then, and then and people, here's what, it's called church hopping. You heard of it? You've had friends leave, people, new people come from different churches. That's what happens when we don't get on mission and we don't pursue our friends. You get tired of your church and you bounce to the new church or you go over there. So I'm gonna give you some encouragement here. How do you join the mission to be on a relentless pursuit? Number one, it starts with a burden. In your heart, it starts with a burden. You gotta care, you gotta care about the lost people in your life, the people who are far from God. Here's what Jesus said, this is tough to hear, but these, this is what he said. He said, whoever believes in the Son of God has eternal life, which I'm assuming a lot of us have done that. We're, we're on our way to heaven, we've trusted in Jesus, he's forgiven of our sins, but, but, it's a big but. Whoever rejects the Son, says no to the Son, doesn't believe in the Son, will not see life, for God's wrath remains on them. Whoa. They're on their way to hell. 
in our culture today, unfortunately, it's so disturbing. There's a lot of people out there that have, 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 have turned away from God and then they make jokes about hell. Well, you know, there's gonna be a party down there. All my friends are going. We're, we're, gonna, we're gonna live it up in hell. And it just breaks my heart because there's no parties in hell. There's nothing but suffering in hell. It's eternal separation from God and all that is of God. Now think with me for a second about what that means. I woke up this morning and I saw the sunrise. Anybody else see the sunrise this morning? No sunrises in hell. No sunset, no sunsets in hell. No, no, no friendship in hell. No conversations in hell. No ice cream in hell. No warm beds in hell. No warm showers in hell. No, te- no Netflix in hell. No... no no clothing, no, no water. There's no water. There's nothing to drink in hell. There's no music in hell. Anything that you like in this earth is absent in hell. There's no sign of God or anything that has come from God in hell which is why the biblical writers can only come up with words like eternal fire to describe it because it is absolutely a godless place. And you wouldn't want to wish that on your worst enemy. And unless you have that burden, you're not gonna care. Church will be about you. Well, I hope the sermon's good this weekend. Man, I hope Chelsea's singing. She can kill it. I hope Pastor Danny's funny. Hope I get something for my soul. And church becomes something you consume rather than something you're on mission with. Make sense? It starts with a burden for people. You never come across a person, whether it's at Starbucks or the grocery store or wherever it is that you go, that is not either on their way to heaven or on their way to hell. And you personally must embrace that. It's not enough for me as your pastor to embrace that. I'm fine with it. I get it. I have the burden. It's why I do what I do. What about you? It starts with a burden. Secondly, you have to be credible. If you want to be on mission at Emmanuel, be on the relentless pursuit, you got to be believable. You can't be acting a fool at work. Gossiping, backbiting, stealing, posting weird stuff online. <laughs> like, you have to actually have, have a credible platform to, 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 to make a difference in someone's life. Otherwise, they, they're just gonna look at you like, dude, you're weird and you're, you're a hypocrite. Listen to what Jesus said. He said, you're the salt of the earth. Now, salt in those days had d- different uh, uh, functions. You know, it could preserve things, but it also added flavor. In our world today, it's mostly flavor. He's talking about the flavor aspect of it. He says, your life is supposed to add flavor to life. Like people are supposed to look at your life and be like, wow, that's what life could be like? It's really good, I want some of that. That's kind of what he's saying. But what good is salt if, it's, if, if it has no flavor? Can you make it salty again? Rhetorical question, no, you can't. It will be thrown out and trampled underfoot as, say it with me, worthless. In other words, if your life is not credible, you're going to start to try to help people come to church or, and they're going to be like, dude, shut up. I can't, I can't listen to anything you have to say. Your life is filled with anger and uh, lust and, and deception and, and, and you use the F word constantly and it's like, why would I ever listen to you? I love what, 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 Jesus said to the Pharisees, he said this really simply, Matthew chapter uh, three, he said, prove by the way that you, say with me, live. Prove by your life, by the way you go through life that you've repented of your sins and turned to God. There should be something different about you. C.S. Lewis said this perfectly. He captured it in his book, Mere Christianity. He said, when Christians behave badly or fail to behave well, we're making Christianity unbelievable to the outside world. How many Christians have just become so hypocritical that when they try to to, to reach their friends, their friends are like, dude, no way. Like the whole reason why I've really been working on going through roundabouts, like I've really been working on this. (laughs) 
And, and I have issues with it. I really do. Like some people see a roundabout and they think it's a go sign. So they hit the gas and they fly through it. And then some people think that it's a stop sign. It's like, no. Some people actually put their blinker on. It's like, no, I've got lots of issues. I'm working with a counselor on it. <laughs> and I used to get so frustrated with people that I would like literally do something wrong. I would honk or yell. I, I never flip the finger. I just, I don't do that. I don't go that low, but I've thought about it. And the reason I'm working on that is because if I go through a roundabout in, a, in an unchristian way and then people see the sticker, they see the sticker on the back of the car. I have it on the back of the car. If I'm driving like a fool and, I'm, and, and they see this, what are they going to do? There goes that other hypocrite pastor, you know. See, when you put the, when you put the shirt on, it means something. I mean, I, I think it's cool. I think it's a cool brand, but don't put it on if you're a fool. <laughs> or at least try not to be a fool. Because why? You're, then you, your message is not, it's not credible. You with me, yes or no? So it starts with a burden. Then you have to be credible. And then, and then number three, at some point, you gotta speak up. You gotta speak up. Like some, some Christians believe that, well, I don't really talk about religion. It's a personal matter. I just I don't bring it up. It's like politics. You don't bring it up. Besides, if I bring it up, they're going to think I'm a religious fanatic. I don't want them to think that. They're going to, they're, if, I, if I tell them I'm a Christian or if I invite them in or talk to them about God, they're going to think I'm a bigot, a hater, and I don't want, want that. You know, I'm not allowed to bring that up. You know, what, besides, what if, what if I bring it up and they ask me a question I don't know the answer to? What am I going to do then? I'm going to look stupid. And so we have all these reasons why we just, shh, we don't talk about Jesus to our friends or our neighbors. And at some point, it's just not okay. You must speak up. Listen to what Paul said in Romans chapter 10. He said, how can they call on him to save them unless they believe in him? And how can they believe in him if they've never heard about him? And now, how can they hear about him unless, say it with me, someone tells them? Now, you can rely upon me to do that, that's fine, but you still have to speak up and invite somebody to church. What are you doing Saturday? What are you doing Sunday at nine? What are you doing Sunday at 11? Why don't you come on over? I think it could help you. You're still speaking up. I think you should, I think you should go beyond that. But at some point, you have to speak up if someone's gonna come to faith in Christ. Think about it like this. Someone spoke up for you. Like, would you be here today if someone didn't speak up? A friend? A coworker? I mean, you watched the video earlier. Would Tanner be here today if Gabe didn't speak up at football practice? Yes or no? No, Tanner wouldn't be here. But Gabe Long had a burden for his friends and he had a credible life. And he said, he said to his teammates, hey, you got to come to church. I'm telling you, it'll change your life. And Tanner listened and he came because Gabe Long had enough courage to speak up. Who spoke up for you? Was it a mother, a father? A teammate, a brother, a sister. I'm blessed today to have my whole family in church and that's rare. They're all sitting down here. Uh, my son, Andrew, my son, Bo, my daughter, Ruby, my beautiful wife, Jackie, my mom and my dad are all here today, which is extremely rare. And I got to thinking about the person in my life who spoke up. I got to thinking about the person who, who shared Jesus with me and took me to church and how I got to this space right here to be able to share Jesus with you. And it was, it was my mom, and she's here today. In fact, some of you have never seen her before. So I'm gonna do something that's gonna just freak her out right now. So she's yeah, having a little freak out mode. I'm just gonna ask her to come up here. Would you, would, you do, would you do that? Would you do that? Yeah, just, come on. This is my mom, come on. I know you hate this. <laughs> come on over here, come on over here. I've never introduced my mom to you guys before. <laughs> she's a little short, but she's got a lot. She's got a big spirit, you know what I'm saying? And I just wanna say thank you with all my heart. As a little boy, you spoke up and you shared with me what Jesus meant, who he was and you helped me to put my faith in him. 
And because you did that, I get to share with everybody else. And I thank God for that. So there thank you so much. I was about to ask her to say something, but then she really would get on me when I got home. <laughs> See, what's true for me is true for you. You had, you had someone in your life speak up and say, hey, this is who Jesus is. This is why you need him in your life. And all I'm asking you to do is to, to be that somebody for your friends, for your loved one, brother, sister, whoever. That's far from God. Paul told us this. He, he gave it to us. He said, for God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, no longer counting people's sins against them. Wow. Like that's the offer on the table. And then Paul says this. And he gave us, me and you, this wonderful message of rec reconciliation. Therefore, we are Christ's ambassadors. We are his representative. God is making his appeal through us. So we speak, we talk for Christ when we plead with our friends and neighbors and coworkers and family members, come back to God. That is what this church is all about. And if you like that, if that resonates with you, Emmanuel's gonna be a great place for you. If you're like, I want none of that, I just wanna come to a church and consume and listen to some music and get in a positive, encouraging message, then it's just a matter of time before you trade, before you switch restaurants. And I'm encouraging you, don't do that. Be on mission. Be part of something that's changing people's eternities. Billy Graham preached to more people than anybody who's ever lived thus up to this point. Millions and millions of people through his crusades and television programs. Here's what Billy said. Heaven is real and hell is real and eternity is but a breath away. Since I've been speaking, 3,600 people have perished. Heaven and hell are real and eternity is a breath away. And God is asking you and me to be a part of the relentless pursuit. So here's my question. Who are you relentlessly pursuing? Who is it? Is it a son or a daughter, a friend, a brother, a sister, a coworker, a teammate? Who's the, who's the tanner in your life that's far from God? Do you have a burden for him, her, is your life credible? And will you, will you speak up? We're gonna wrap up with a, with a song today. And during this song, I'm just gonna ask you, we do this around here, we've done it for a long time. We, we, we take those people's names, like Tanner, and we write them on stuff. <laughs> we used to write them on the stage. <laughs> we used to, literally, we used to take pens. The whole stage was filled with names. And it was like, man, it kind of looks like graffiti, so we stopped doing that. Uh, but we still write them on the walls. We actually have boards on the walls here and up upstairs. Uh, and there's pens right there. And during this song, I'm just gonna ask you to that, that, get that person in your mind. And then when you feel led to, just get up out of your seat and go write their name on the board and begin praying for opportunities to make an impact in their, in their life. And then uh, we'll, we'll wrap up after that's over. So I'm standing in front of one of our Relentless Pursuit boards at our Greenwood campus. And on this boards are hundreds of names that our people at the Greenwood campus who they are relentlessly pursuing. See, all of our campuses have these boards around the auditorium, and since the online campus doesn't have one of these boards because we meet digitally, here's what I want you to do sitting at home or maybe at work. I want you to grab a post-it note, maybe a whiteboard. My family has a whiteboard on our fridge, maybe a cork board with a piece of paper that you can pin to, and I want you to write down the name of the person you are going to relentlessly pursue. And I want you to keep that name in front of you, and I want you to pray for that person every single day this week. Heaven and hell is real. And that's why we gotta keep relentlessly pursuing the people God is putting in your life and in my life. Before we end our time together, I want you to ponder something with me real quick. Imagine that you were $50 trillion in debt and you go to the bank and you say, I can never pay this off. A thousand lifetimes, I still wouldn't be able to pay this off. And what if the president of the bank said to you, See, I'm gonna have grace and mercy for you and I'm gonna forgive you your debt. You would be grateful for sure. But if he did that, when you left the bank, guess what, you'd still be broke. See, every penny you had was caught up in your debt spiral. You would then have to get to work and start learning and earning a living. 
I think some of us see the gospel as this type of story. The gospel, the good news, oh, it's way better than this. It's way better than that. The gospel, this is the gospel. It would be that when you went to the president of the bank and you tell them that you can't pay it off, pay off your debt, your $50 trillion of debt, the president of the bank looks at you and tells you that I'm gonna cancel all your debt. Oh, oh, and by the way, I'm gonna adopt you as my own kid. Oh, and there's one more thing. Here's a debit card to the bank. All I have is yours. That right there is the fullness of the gospel. That is true love. Ephesians 2 says, you and I were dead in our sin. That means we were six feet under, we're a corpse. And then in verse four, he says, but God, who is rich in mercy, sent his son Jesus to pay the debt that you and I owed. He paid the debt with his life. He died and rose again. And hear me, if the tomb is empty, anything is possible. What does that mean? Your shame, it was nailed to the cross and it has been bought and paid for. Your guilt, your addiction, your pride, it's all been covered. It's up to you now to step into this new life with Jesus. Paul says in Romans that if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that Jesus has risen from the dead, guess what? You will be saved. So what if Jesus is saying to you right now, I see the weight, I see the debt you're carrying around. I'm here to take that weight off of you and I'm ready to adopt you into my family. I have so much more for you. Give me your life and watch me change your life. And that's you right now. Maybe sitting at home, maybe at work, you're at the gym, I don't know where you're at. I'm gonna say a simple prayer and I want you to pray this prayer with me right now. Will you pray with me? So Father, I know that I am a sinner. I am shackled with debt because of the choices that I have made. And you said, Paul said, that if I confess with my mouth that Jesus is Lord, and believe in my heart that Jesus rose from the dead, I will be saved. So right now I'm confessing that I am broken and I am in desperate need of a savior. And I am believing that Jesus was not just a good man who existed 2000 years ago, but he was the king of the universe who existed before time. And he loved me so much that he gave his life for me. And so I am choosing to believe and step into that relationship with Jesus. So Jesus right now, I give you my life. I love you. And thank you for saving me. Amen. If you just made the decision to follow Jesus, congratulations. The most important decision that you will ever make in your life. And we want to celebrate with you. If you made that decision, we actually have something for you. It's something we call a save box. And in this box, it looks just like this. There's a New Believers Bible. There's next steps in there. There's a coffee mug. Everything you need for your spiritual journey is in this. But here's what you got to do. You got to text SAVE 65248. SAVE 65248 and fill out a brief form online and then I'll connect with you this week and uh, just help you on your new journey of faith. But congratulations again, this is so exciting. Thank you again for being here with us today. If you are new, thank you. Make sure you text NEW65248 so we can send you a gift in the mail. I hope to see you either online next week or maybe at one of our campuses or e-microsite locations as we jump back into week two of Relentless Pursuit. Well, up next, our children's ministry experience. You guys have an incredible week and bring a friend.